What is up my peeps? Joshua Smith here and welcome to the GSD Mode Podcast. So real quick, before we jump into today's epic, amazing podcast interview, make sure to check us out at gsdmode.com where you can see previous interviews as well as a bunch of other free resources that will help you massively grow your real estate business. Also, if you enjoy and find value and see value in the content here at GSD Mode, make sure that you share the show with somebody that you feel can benefit from the content that we are releasing. This show is possible because of all your support and your support truly means a lot. Now let's jump into today's interview and go have some fun. Peace. What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GS Demo podcast interview every single week. I interview top entrepreneurs, top real estate professionals, and strip top badasses that they're dominating their space. These are people choosing to not live a life of mediocrity, but instead to go out there and create big, amazing, epic lives for themselves and their families, as well as have a big impact on others. And today, you guys, got another badass guest on the show. This is a dude that I've known for a long time. And since the time that I've known him and his business, has just exploded, continues to grow. And to give you a little backstory on our guest today, start off uh, building homes as a home builder. And then with the market crash, the, the, the global market crash, market recession of 2008, um, unfortunately, just like a lot of builders, he was uh, forced to, to shut down the shop. Um, but he transitioned from building homes to selling homes. Two months later, officially got his license um, and started off in the real estate industry doing a lot of BPOs, did over a thousand BPOs out of the, right out of the gate early on in his career and selling short sales. Um, and by 2010, so this is just year uh, under two years later, uh, was already in the top 100 of, of real, all real estate agents in his local market, uh, doing over 50 home sales in 2010. So he got licensed in, in May of 2009, and then in the year 2010 did 50 home sales. So uh, absolutely crushed it there. Uh, that evolved into a team o- over time into now his brokerage officially uh, became a broker owner in 2016. And check this out, you guys. Last year, uh, his brokerage did 4,500 home sales and over a billion dollars in gross volume sales. So um, and being a guy that's been able to, to know him going through all of this growth and witness it, man, it's, it's, it's been awesome to see. So I'm really stoked and honored to, have, honored to have my good friend, Shane Torres, on the show. Show my friend. Well, thanks for having me. That, I don't, that's a pretty good in, introduction. I don't know that I would, uh, can live up to all that hype. <laughs> nah, dude, you're, you're crushing it, man. And, and what, what's so cool about, you know, the, the, some of the most successful people I meet out, out there, just like yourself, are so humble, you know, right? And I, and I love that, man. It's, um, but you're, you're, you're killing it. We were just talking before we hit the record button. Man, the last time that we saw each other in person was probably right before you pulled the trigger on this brokerage. Is that about right? Yeah, like we. Uh, yeah, it was about four years ago, actually. I was a minor partner at the time, but we were at a, a Jeff Cohen's event over in Omaha. And uh, shortly after that, the opportunity popped up to do this and buy into the brokerage. Yeah, so before we get into all that, dude... Um, you know, let, let's rewind the clocks, man. I'm always intrigued in our guests, you know, our journeys that led them to where they are. Um, so, you know, what, what, what led you into this space in the first place, man? Because you start off as a builder. You know, it was an industry that you grew up in. Uh, were you always a builder, you know, out of school? Or, or how, did, how did, you know, your, your path into that begin in the first place? Yeah, so, no, I was never, I wasn't, I never grew up in actually, my, my background's very humble and crazy, nothing like that. Um, I actually thought I wanted to be a, a civil engineer. And then I did some research and realized I'm not good at math and science. So, so that didn't work out. And then I went to school for framing and so carpentry and building trades. And then uh, just when I got out of school, I just started framing and I just been around the trades since I was like, you know, early twenties. So I evolved from a framer. I've done uh, trim work, siding work, concrete. I have, um, uh, you know, anything, anything in between. And then as I watch people and I grew and I start to own the framing company and I, I, I'm always watching what the next person is doing, like that next level up. So if you're the, you're the foreman, you're watching what the supervisor is doing, you're watching what the, you know, the owner's doing. So when the opportunity came to, uh, I just wanted to build homes. And so, uh, had the opportunity to do so. And I had this, I was supposed to be, you know, getting this 
chunk of cash, if you will. Uh, everyone was making all these promises and it showed up and it was like a thousand bucks. I'm like, what am I going to do with this? So I started an LLC and then um, a, a local guy, after a year of being told no, a local developer said, well, what if, I, what if I subordinate you a lot? What if I give you a lot and you go borrow against that? So I did and the bank said, yeah, and that was how we did our first home. Had some good years of success with framing and uh, big framing crews and doing hotels and retirement centers and houses. And, you know, I, I was young. I was in my mid-20s and, you know, I made some stupid financial moves, buying stuff. You know, never, no one predicted that was going to crash the way it did. And we didn't stock money away like we should have. And, and then at the time, I'd already started getting my real estate license. So after going through a few months of, I would say, depression of after losing my home building company and being turned down after over, you know, a couple hundred jobs, I had one test left to take. So I borrowed that money to get all the, my upfront classes and tests done from my father-in-law. Uh, and I want to go on to, to step back. I failed my state test uh, twice because I thought I knew everything. And then I borrowed money from my father-in-law. I knew I had one more shot to pass this test and uh, I'm not a good test taker. Showed up an hour early, read through the study book, immediately ran in, took the test and I passed. And then that's how I began. So then, you know, with, with that journey, like what, what led you to getting the real estate license instead of, you know, when, you're, when your home building company went under, instead of just going back to what, what you started with framing, you know, um, was that something that you explored? Was there just no work in that? you know, trade well, anymore that led you to get into real estate or what, like what spurred the thought of, man, I'm just going to jump into real estate. So, well at the time, so, so I could have went back into framing, but at the time in the local market, the framing prices had prior years have been about seven fifty a square foot. And then they were getting down to about $2 a square foot, which is why part of, I had a framing company. That's part of why it went under in the first place um, is because the prices just got out of hand and where they were just rock bottom. But I knew, you know, I, I, I was in foreclosure. I was in bankruptcy. I had nothing to lose. So why not give this real estate a try? I actually wanted to do real estate when I was in my early 20s. And my boss at the time, his, his uh, family owned a brokerage and he basically scared the crap out of me so bad. I'm like, I'm not doing that. And it was like, you know, I had nothing else going on. I was being turned down. And I was trying to... Um, I was applying for a super, superintendent jobs for big, you know, commercial general contractors. I was searching Omaha, Kansas City, Minneapolis, basically anywhere in the Midwest. And I was just being told no left and right. So at that point, like I said, I had nothing left to lose. I did. I have, I, and to this day, he's a good friend of mine. Um, he, uh, he, uh, he hired me part time to do construction work. I would do uh, construction with him in the morning, and I would do real estate in the afternoon. And then in the winter, I uh, he allowed, you know I drove one of his trucks. We plowed snow uh, throughout the winter. You know I did whatever I had to do for a few weeks until the BPO thing blew up. I was getting up early, doing going to drive tr uh, a forklift down at one of the local loading docks for a trucking company. Um, so I just was doing whatever I had to do to make ends meet. I had one goal, uh, two goals really. And that was to try get out of the mess I was in and, and save my house. Yeah. Love that man. Love that dude. And, and yeah, I mean, you, you don't get to the level that you're at right now without having a friggin' strong ass work ethic. You know, I, I mean, I hear so many real estate agents just bitching, moaning and whining, but they just won't get off the couch, you know? Right. right. So I mean, you're, you're definitely a hustler and, yeah. and, and that, yeah, that sort of shows to, you know, true to that. And, Dude, what a brilliant way to start off your career, your real estate career with, with getting into the BPO um, uh, area. You know, now today when the market's strong, there, there's not as many available, of course, but man, it, you know, it, what, what I loved about REO and really doing the BPO elements of, of the REO is, you know, I mean, because, because they're like mini appraisals, right? You really, truly learn how to value homes. You know, right. That's not, one of the things I tell everybody. Yeah. You know, right? So, so I'm, I'm kind of interested in that because it's something that I think, even though there's less of them today, mm -hmm. you know, as new agents, man, I, I, I think getting into BEPO is number one, it's, it's some ex additional cash, you know, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it gets you so damn good at knowing your market so fast. Right. You know, kind of talk to us about that. Like, like what, how'd you get in? What led to it? Um, and then how did you manage doing a thousand BPOs? You know, that's a great <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, uh, and then, you know, I'd love to hear, you know, what you feel that that, 
the power of having that foundation is done for you in your business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, that's a huge part of the background and the story. I was just talking to a few of my team agents this morning about this um, because that's kind of how it all started. So when I was getting started, just like everyone else, I was out there trying to hustle and find those deals. And, and, you know, you stumble across a few people that want to be investors and they're like, Hey, I want to see this house. So I'm trying to contact all these REO agents, but no one's getting back to me. So I originally, contacted our local, our broker at the time. And I'm like, Hey, I want to be an REO agent. How do I do that? I think I can do really well with that. And so he's like, just, he gave me a list. He's like, fill out everything on this list. So in between all my other things that I just talked about job wise, I went through and I started filling out the, the information for all these asset management companies. And right away, what I realized is that you have to know someone to really get in or you know, uh, with asset management company or just continually hound them. But a lot of people were established already at that time. So, but what started to happen was, and I vividly remember it, it was the middle of a sleet storm and I got a phone call that says, Hey, will you service, will you, can you service this area? Uh, to, to do a BPO. And I was like, uh, sure. You know, I really, at this point, I really wasn't even sure what a BPO was yet. yet. I just knew there was potential there because they told me how much they would pay. This is an hour and a half away. I drove there in a sleet storm, did the BPO. And then at the time, and, and they're still similar this, to this uh, extent, is at the time, the more BPOs you do, the more, um, you're, it's like you're graded, like on a scale of one to 10. And in the very beginning, you have to accept them all manually. Well, I'd be at dinner with friends and stuff and, and, and it would go off. I'd, I'd be like, where's your computer? And I would run and I would accept those. Like it's all the time, nonstop. And all of a sudden you start getting automatic. And then one day I get a phone call at the time of uh, the company was, I believe LSI at the time that said, um, Hey, we just got the contract for Freddie Mac for the state of Iowa. How many can you handle and where do you service? And I said, as many as you can. And within a 60 mile radius of the Des Moines Metro, it, it just exploded from there. Um, it was just daily. I would wake up with just a chunk of, I, I think the most I ever did was 15 in one day. Um, and I got to the point to where I was hammering them out in about 15 minutes. So now how, how do you do that many? Um, this is where I started to kind of evolve a lot of my systems and know that I needed to be systematic because in the very beginning I, I'd get BPOs and I'd run here and I'd run here and I was spending so much time, um, driving, it wasn't very productive. So I started to map out my route every day in a big circle. And I would get up in the morning, I would do the, the data entry for the BPOs from the day before. I would then plan out my route so that I could pop over and do photos of the BPOs for that day um, in between my meetings and then um, do it all over again the next day. Well, it got to the point to where that got to be a little too much. So then I started to have my wife go take photos for me. I I started to eliminate the interior because they just weren't, they, they took too much, too, too much time un, unless, you know, it, there was a special request. Um, and then um, once that got to be a little too much, I then would have, I'd, I'd send a list of comps that I would want to use to a, an admin I had. And I would say, fill in as much data as you can on the report with this, these comps. And then I would go in afterwards and I would make all the adjustments that were required. And then I would submit the report to make sure it was going to pass on the first time. Cause after a while you start to get an idea of what they're wanting and it just snowballed from there. And like I said, that, that you know, that first year, that first full year, I did, uh, you know, about 50,000 in GCI, but I also did 50,000 in BPO. That, got me to an extent out of the mess I was in at the time. It, it saved my house. It saved uh, quite a bit of things at that time. And I knew that I could do this. So, but that's kind of what it started to evolve. Um, now as how it impacts today or how it impacted my uh, knowledge, you do it. I literally, I, I can look at a neighborhood and, and look at a house and know what it's worth without having to do a CMA. It, it gave a ton of credibility. Very few people can speak you know, spit out exactly what a house is worth and be that accurate without having that much knowledge. So I have in the past tried to get newer agents to come on because it's some nice supplemental income 
they get frustrated with all the quality control stuff and they just stop doing it, not seeing the potential upside aside from the potential extra money in your pocket. The knowledge you get is, is phenomenal. So, I mean, it's been that along with my construction background has been a big part of how, you know, we've gotten to where we are. Yeah. And I love it, man. And it's, it's, uh, I, you know, I don't know your take on this, but I truly believe it's more important than ever before to really niche down and, and, and really become that local expert. Yep. And it's crazy to me. You know, this was a big eye opener. Um, I had, uh, at one of my local events, I had a good buddy of mine, Leo Pereja come up and, and mm-hmm. speak. And he, he, before he, he sold his team and started remind, you know, he yeah. was the number one KW agent in the world. And, um, you know, he was in there talking about, uh, uh, differentiating himself in his marketplace, you know, right. And, right. and uh, um, where he, because he knew he flipped so many homes and he's such a, a big investor in himself. Right. Um, he would go into a property and be like, all right, well here, I mean, here's the as is price, right. Here's if you put in 10 grand, here's put in 30 grand. Now here's if we do a full remodel. And then he had the crews that, that could go in there and, and take care of it all for yep. concierge, you know, service. And it just kind of clicked to me at that point of, man, like it, us real estate agents, we spend so much time learning about legion and all this stuff, but how, how, how much time do we spend uh, taking appraisal courses and, and, and really learn, you know, learning about staging and things that really impact our clients. You know, right. Right? agents can't go in there and be like, all right, well, you've got an outdated kitchen. If you were to, you know, uh, update the cabinets, put in some granite, put in these appliances, right. Spend five grand and connect you this, you know, that they're not able to articulate that. Right. Um, and uh, so that's one big transition that we've done is, is just level up heavily, you know, with guest speakers you know, almost every other week coming in, just speaking so heavily to that to increase our knowledge base as a team. Um, but it's so important today where, where when somebody tells you, you know, what subdivision they live in, how, how many bedrooms, bathrooms, like you should know who that builder is. Maybe right. even in their home, but you, you know that floor plan inside now and you're able to, to you know, speak to that valuation before you go there. Um, and like you said, that, that had that foundation and it just seems to be, especially with all these discounters and, and I buyers out there, you know, right. It's, it's more important in my belief than ever before. I agree a hundred percent. I say that all the time, but to this day is extremely hard to get people to really understand that. Yeah. Yeah. And, but that, but that's okay. Right. Because it right. makes it that much easier. Like in real estate, I've never seen an industry where it's just so easy to differentiate yourself from everybody else and really go out there and dominate. You know, right? like, cause there's so many damn lazy, uncommitted human beings in this, this industry, where, um, and not, not, you know, I know you and I are committed. Those that are watching this are committed because they're, they're committed to their, their leveling up, but it just made, dude, it's, it's like fishing with dynamite in this industry. Right. Well, it's like, you know, being a, a broker and an owner too, as we coach, as we coach our agents and you're, you're telling them all these things, it's amazing once they actually really understand it and they buy into it and it clicks and then everyone else just kind of steps back and is like, what did they do? They didn't do anything overly, um, trend setting they just worked at it i mean it's you know darren hardy's compound effect you know okay. little things that add to big results yeah love it dude so you know your, your first couple of years and i don't know how long you're doing the bpos for but you know bpo short sales it was it was the market right yep my market yep. it was the same thing man if you weren't doing reo and short sales like you just weren't selling a lot of real estate um yeah. um but then as the market transitioned and turned Yep. Yeah, like, what did you do then? Because I, you know, this was something that I had to to overcome because I got so known as is an REO agent, a short sale mm-hmm. agent, that, and I branded myself so heavily that right. way. You know, right? That then when the market started to turn, man, it, I had to combat people that were like, "Oh, I didn't know you did regular sales." You know, right? Like, what what was your transition and how did you pivot and what happened next? It was it was it was honestly it was pretty um, quiet, if you will. So so I again I was since I was coming out of the chapter seven and in the foreclosure and everything, I didn't have a lot of expendable money at the time. So where the short sales were, they were very heavily. Um, on the south and east side of our metro uh, and that's where I ended up doing a lot of that business at so I, at some one point people thought I lived there but I didn't um what I was also doing um is just getting very heavily involved in my local community and that is you know right now we're at the time it was probably a town of like 3500 now we're about 4500 um I became the member of the chamber. I got on the board. I was the president for a few years. I started to be seen more. And so I started to get a big presence in our local community, which then helped me overflow into other areas. And part of that was I started, um, I, again, cause I didn't have a lot of money. I, I broke the town up into four sections. And once 
a month, I would send it to one of those four sections and it would rotate and, and it takes time. And after about 18 months, it started to click. And to this you know, day, we have a very large presence in, in this town. And that just, once you do that, so we were the common fixture in two areas. It just kind of overflowed into other areas and people would, you know, call and be like, Hey, I want to buy the short sale, but I got to sell my house. And it just snowballed. And before you knew it, uh, you know, we were up in the top of the rankings and, uh, it, like I said, it was very quiet. It wasn't something that I ever like, this is what we're doing. This is, you know, how we're doing it. And back then I was very secretive about how I did it. Um, and then, um, I, I, I stopped with the secrecy and, you know, I, I get what you mean about the people saying, you know, did, um, you know, I thought you didn't, I didn't think you did regular sales. There's occasionally to this day I'll get, Hey, is this a short sell? You know, and we, we've done like two and four years. So, uh, but yeah, it was, it was just, we started to become a pretty common fixture on all the, all the, uh, websites, you know, the Zillow's, the Trulia's, uh, I, I did in the very beginning, I was very, I did adapt, um, Zillow, uh, back when it was affordable, um, for the first few years, that was, that was good to us because of our presence and our listing volume. Um, but it kind of is all compound together as to how we did it. So then uh, at what point did you transition into, to, cause if I, if I'm correct, you had a team for yep. some time, um, before you got into the brokerage side, yep. so at what point, at what point did you uh, start the team? And, and at what point did you know that you were ready to start the team? Um, so I started the team originally and it was all my stuff has been all my team, all my staff, all my agents is everything's been organically. I've never really recruited to anything. And so it started with, um, the person, one person saying that they wanted to start a virtual assistant business. And if I'd ever have a use for that. And I was like, well, not right now, but maybe, maybe six months from now. And it was almost six months to the day. And this was, uh, early 2012 that, um, uh, or no, maybe it's 2011 that I started kind of doing some virtual assistant stuff. Uh, right. And she's the one who was doing the, you know, entry for me, the BPO and stuff. And uh, I started off at 10 hours a week and then I just started throwing stuff at her and I, it was building more and more systems and I was watching videos and things like that. And I would be like, Hey, I want to do this, you know, Google how we can do it and let's create a system within a few weeks. Uh, she was uh, full. She was working 40 hours a week for me and she was still doing a few things for another person for a few other people. And then after a while she was strictly for me. Um, I want, I, I decided I wanted to open an office in uh, 2012, but it was just a team office. And at that point she started coming in to the office and, you know, again, at that, you know, rehiring someone after you lost everything like that, that actually hiring that one person back again was the scariest thing that I ever did. Um, it, it, since when since bouncing back um because that's that one person that you're paying whether you're making money or not but then the way that i decided i needed to add more people and this sounds very silly but it's the, the truth is if i made it like if i made them in this case with her if i made a mistake like maybe i forgot to email someone in a timely manner or timely manner i knew it was time to hire someone else if she made a mistake, maybe forgot to make a phone call or something, I knew it was time to bring on someone else. So it honestly stemmed from other people's mistakes that I added uh, more people. And I didn't bring on a ton of team agents right away. And I still don't have a ton. Um, I, ha I would have what I would, ha what would call as overflow agents. And we divided the local metro up into four sections. And I just went to the agents and said, hey, you know, I have some overflow in these areas would you be interested in taking some leads? And we worked out a deal, whether I sent it to them and I'd spoken to them or whether I sent it to them and I hadn't spoken to them. And that's the first year, um, that next first year we did the 20 million in production. And it was just in, in the part of that was, and you, this is spoken about a lot on your, on the show here is that I was still gone a lot. And I was, I was at all my kids events and things like that. And in my wife and I were having a little disagreement once. And then, uh, I said, I don't understand what's wrong. I'm at all the kids events. And she said, well, what about me? It was at that point I started understanding and learning the value of leveraging your time by bringing on more people. So at this point I didn't start the team to just make a ton of money. I started to buy my time. 
which is essentially what I have done uh, since then. So um, it, a lot of it was, like I said, it was from um, just mistakes being made is how I knew it was time. Yeah. I mean, that's such a smart way to grow, grow, right? I mean, I, I, there's more team leaders that end up failing um, and there are agents that fail in this business, right? And, and what I mean by that is not that they're failing dropping out of the business, but they, they have this ambition to start a team. They start this team, realize it's too much of a headache, you know, not what they thought it was, and then retract going back to an individual agent. And, and, and a lot of that is because they grew out of want, not out of necessity. You exactly. Know, right? um, and, and the way that you grew it of, of, hey, I've got overflow. I can send you these leads. Maybe if it's, a, a, like if it's somebody, hey, this guy, I've already talked to this person. They're pre-qualified. They want to buy a house. Those you split 50 50. Anybody, any leads I refer you, just pay me a referral, flat 25% referral fee, whatever it may be. That's exactly what it was. Yeah. And on those, man, I mean, you, you eliminate the, the risk of the responsibility of having to, to feed, you know, to, to be yep. feed them leads, to, to have office space for them, to have admin on place for them. Um, yep. And it also just gives you a way of, of just testing that revenue coming in. And it's, it's right. like, I wish to God I would have grew my team that way. You know, I yeah. didn't think of it. Yeah. And, and that's what, you know, a lot of what I do nowadays in, in my day-to-day -day stuff is I tell people that I, I want to be the, well, I'm a wealth of knowledge of what not to do. So I want to help them get to that success level that they want, but avoid the, the mistakes and the pitfalls that I made. Cause like everybody, you know, I've, I've wasted money on marketing that didn't, didn't work. I've done different systems that didn't work. And I try to use that to help them to avoid that. And you were right on the head when you said people usually will start it out of want, but not necessity. They think they just bring on another other person and it's going to magically bring revenue to them. And that's not the case when I, we all stress that an assistant should be your first hire It's when they hire that agent first without the systems, like you mentioned, it just doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, and when you comes to, when you understand that it's like, look, when I bring on somebody that should increase my capacity. Yeah. Right. So like yep. individual agent, no assistant, you can be out there banging out, you know, 40, 50 deals a year. Yeah. Right. With a full-time rock star admin, you can be banging out a hundred deals a year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And cause, and I don't know if you've experienced this, but it, it, and it seems more, you know, more, the more that I get involved with, with other, you know, see other people developing their teams as well. Um, and this held true for me, uh, man, I, I mean, it takes getting to like 10 agents, like 10 full-time agents before even 50% of your, you know, 50% of, of your commission's dollars coming in um, are from those 10 agents. Yeah, right? right. So yes, correct. Point where you're, you know, you 80-90% of your production um, coming in still from the team leader. And so you got to make sure that 80-90% of your time is focused on your own production. Yeah, right. right? And it, I mean, it took me 20 agents um, in eight years to two, and 20 agents to get to the point where I was able to step out of production with enough revenue coming in that could pay me a salary, you know, to step out of production, and just become, you know, f fully focused on, on the, the team level. Mm -hmm. so it, it, it's so much more than I think most people think. And, and right. what I learned through that, like the biggest lesson I learned through all of it is my ability of being a great real estate agent had nothing to do with my ability of being a great team leader or brokerage owner. Yeah, right. right. Um, it's it's how good of an entrepreneur are you? How great of a leader right. are you? You know, right. Right. totally different skill set. It takes time to learn that skill set. Well, I think a lot of mine was learned or that I learned from trial and error. I mean, you, you lose a company, you know, when I had my home building company, I had at one time 40 full time employees and a couple hundred subs. I learned a lot of lessons from that scenario. What happened there? You know, what I went through, um, I would not wish on anybody, but I also wouldn't change it because I learned a lot from it and it actually helped me put my priorities in line when they were way out of line prior to that. Yeah. Yeah. Love it, man. So then are you, so you're still operating in addition to the brokerage, you're still operating your team today. Yes. Yep. Yep. Actually. Yeah. We just saw the real trends report, you know, still in the top 10 for the state of Iowa. Um, my team is very well ran. I've got good admin that helps, uh, that help oversee it. Um, as well as that's how, you know, I do the brokerage stuff. A lot of my day-to-day -day stuff is helping managing the brokerage and, and then the, the team. So I have the brokerage, I have the team. Um, I also don't, I don't know why some days I, I uh, started a home building company again about a year ago and I have people that help me manage that. 
of flipping homes. Now I have this coaching thing that I'm doing, um, commercial, some, some, some commercial development. That's something I'd like to do more of in the future. But, uh, it's, it's just, I, uh, and, and other people say, I'm not the first one to say this. I actually, what I do nowadays is I manage systems that manage the people. Yeah. Yeah, you, you got it. Like Steve Jobs always said, man, you know, he'd get so much flack for not being a, a, a software engineer, for not being a coder. Mm-hmm. But he's like, man, I don't. He's, he's like, I, I'm this. I, I'm the conductor, man. I put right. you know, the coders in, in their seat, and yeah. and that's where it becomes, you know, right? Of of just making sure everybody else you're inspecting what you expect, and right, you, know, you hit the nail on the head of, of managing the systems that manage the people and then yeah. hold the people accountable. So yeah. before we get into the brokerage side, man, I'm, I'm curious on your team. Mm-hmm. You know, just because there's been so many transitions, um, uh, when I say transitions, just changes in the industry, you know, right? And I'm not even talking about model shifts and, and I buyers and, you know, that yeah. stuff's always popular. I'm just talking about just changes due to technology. And, mm-hmm. you know, um, I was having a good uh, a conversation with a good buddy of mine that we, we both own software companies. And mm-hmm. we're talking the other day and of like all the behind the scenes stuff that we're seeing right now. It's like in both, he and I both got licensed about the same time in 2005. We're like, man, there, there's more changes that we're seeing now that they haven't been brought forth yet in, in the real estate industry, but they're all right. the behind the scenes stuff that, that's taking place now that will be very, you know, we'll be out, it, we'll, we'll be able to see it very soon. But there's more changes happening in 2019 in that one single year than our whole entire, you know, 13 years of, of real estate prior. Right. With that being said, like, what, what, what are you doing right now, say, in 2019 that's working really well for your team? And when it comes to generating business, um, um, you know, whether that's maybe at this point you guys are getting a lot of past client repeat referral business, maybe that's the majority of your business, or if it's new business coming in. You know, you talked at one point about Zillow. Like, what are you guys doing right now that's driving most of your sales? So, um, yeah, so we have a few different things. At this point, yes, our top, uh, our top, um, revenue source is our SOI, but, um, it's interesting. Uh, um, and I'm a, I'm a date, you know, um, go back a few years. I actually, um, attribute a lot of what I'm doing now to a phone call you and I had in October, 2014. Um, I kinda, we, I don't know if you recall that phone call, but we were connected by Ryan Finch and, within a 30 minute phone call, you directed me to a website to download some stuff. So within that, I downloaded all that. I spent the weekend listening to it and I changed my whole team dynamic. But so then at that point, you kind of turned me on to uh, a, the lead platform conversion. So I had been on that for a few years and I've been watching. And so this is an unsolicited plug. I've been watching perfect storm evolve and I actually flipped to uh perfect storm, uh, February 1st of this year. So I actually have, uh, your software program that we're using right now to generate those Facebook leads. That being said, what we, why I finally did that is last year, um, I had my bookkeeper just pull up everything as far as, um, Facebook, re- the return that we had on our Facebook ads. Cause prior to that, it was a lot of Google. I, I dropped Zillow years ago again based on talking to you and and our friend jeff in omaha um i uh google you know pay-per-click just isn't working like it used to so my my uh bookkeeper comes back and says we we have 652 percent return on facebook ads this year you need to figure out how to spend more money on facebook that's not usually said by a bookkeeper so once I jumped back on, cause we touched base for a, for a while of this, a while on the perfect storm. And I saw that it was fully integrated now and had a back end CRM and all those things. I finally pulled the plug and did it. And, um, and uh, so now we have a lot of Facebook that comes in a couple thousand a, a month. Some that, that are generated by the, the uh, marketing team at perfect storm. Some I do myself. Um, we do still do a lot of uh, local when I, I don't refer to farming as just mailers. Farming to me is just being involved in seeing in the community. So we sponsor a softball team. We sponsor little kids stuff. We're very involved in the local communities and all that stuff kind of ties together from my church. Um, at this point, we like I say we have a couple, probably 22 different. We deal with a handful of builders, investors, um, and they. What well, I mean, they just compile on on top of one another. So you have you know the SOI, then the Facebook, and then you start going down from there to the different ones, and they just all add up. 
Yeah, and what, what's so cool about Facebook, man, I, I did a, a two-hour training for, for some of my clients the other day on uh, an advanced, just some advanced, advanced Facebook marketing strategies of, because you know, a lot of people will sit there and think of, oh man, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna do Facebook. I don't, I'm, I don't do online leads, you know, or whatever. But it, it, look, if you if you play that game right, you know, Facebook marketing enhances everything that you do. I don't care if your cold calling expires or if you are doing direct mail or your spread right. influence. You're at right, the different levels of targeting, and you know, I've got, I've got a four step uh, 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 Facebook marketing funnel I follow, and it just it huh. just murders it, dude. You know, right? Like. For example, we, we take every lead that comes into our system. Um, uh, we do a retargeting campaign right. with our Facebook ads where it, we're hitting them with testimonials, just lists, just solds, you know, right? And, and that took our, our Facebook ad conversion from we were about one out of 100, about 1%, to now we're at one out of 46, at 2% right. conversion. And when you look at the time saved from follow-up calls and what that does to your business, man, it's yep. exponential. It's so powerful. And, and uh, anybody that's not plugged into Facebook marketing heavily at this point, is, is missing the boat, right? It, I mean, it's the most powerful tool that we've ever seen when it comes to a marketing platform. And, and it allows us now, what I love about this is like when you and I first got in the business, kind of had two choices. You can either be rich or famous, like pick right. and choose one, which means I'm either going to do brand marketing like billboards, radio, TV, right. you know, right? Or I'm going to go out there and be smart with my marketing. You know, yeah. now with platforms like Facebook, um, it allows you to, to be, uh, you know, to brand and to market smart. Um, so it allows us to be, you know, the, the rich and the famous or whatever. Um, and, and not only can we do both, everybody should be doing both, right? Cause it's so easy to become that local celebrity, if you will, for pennies on the dollar today. Yeah. Yeah. I agree a hundred percent on that. And it's actually, it's interesting because I think people don't really understand the power of it, but they also are scared of it. So, or, or of, of the, you know, as long as you're no, staying on top of it, it's fairly easy to follow. But I actually, another one of our mutual contacts, uh, John Cheplak, who I know you coach with. Uh, I went to a mastermind uh, actually down there in Scottsdale that he was uh, putting on and he laid out, you know, they let every, there's a lot of Facebook heavy uh, training that he does. And I come back and I taught it to um, one of my people. Okay. So a year goes by, I go to another one of his events in LA and I, and I learn some new stuff, meet some new good people and come back and, you know, I'm still my, I'm, I'm train my people. Well, then that following August, I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to take back control of this. And I started getting really heavily involved in it and doing it myself. Up until that time, our most leads that we pulled in when one month was about 500. We hit close to 2,000 leads that month. And it's been steady since, uh, anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 leads. And it's just going in and keeping it very simple, like you said, doing some retargeting, but there's, there's nothing fancy, just listed price reductions, open houses. And I will be the first to admit, I am not the greatest at grammar, spelling or any other stuff. And, uh, it, it's worked. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and dude, you, one thing that you said there was really powerful of, you know, I mean, you've got, you got to, you got to devote the time, you know, I mean, yeah, it is a learning curve and I, I get it's intimidating, but look, dude, like you and I, I mean, I, I shouldn't say you and I, I don't want to, you know, uh, I guess this is an assumption, you know, um, but I know at least for myself, man, people will look at me, not that I'm, you know, I'm getting older now, um, you know, but I, I'm like at the end of the millennial generation, you know, right? right. So, They'll assume I, I, I grew up with computers and no, dude, like I didn't own a, I didn't personally own a computer until I got into real estate. Yeah. Right. Um, and, uh, dude, I got the business 2005. There's no smartphones that like I've had right. to learn all this stuff as I go, um, as well. But at this point, and I started doing Facebook at marketing in 2015. Um, and if you go into my ads account right now, I've spent about 1.2 million of my own money over mm -hmm. the years, you know, my businesses, um, on Facebook ads. And I just do that. I mean, there's not a time that goes by where I'm not in one or two courses, right? Uh, you know, advanced courses, you know, it costs a G or two G's or whatever, where I'm not learning more about it. But the ROI, man, when you get a, you know, 20 X gross ROI on something, yeah, you know, like that Facebook can give, it's unmatched anywhere else. Right. But it is a learning curve. But for those that are committed to learning it, um, man, it's, it's a game changer for sure. And, and not just for buyers and sellers, but then recruiting to your team, recruiting to your brokerage, right? right? It carries over all the way through. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, just the amount, like I said, 652% last year and people are like, how do you quantify that? That's closed deals. That's not, you know, and, and today 
my philosophy in the last five years is it's power in numbers. I used to be that guy actually when I had Zillow and I was heavily into Zillow, I had a one touch approach. Someone would call me. I'd, I'd try to reach out once. If they didn't answer, I'd throw them on a drip. So those numbers we did in that first year, that was on one touch. So imagine if it had been 15 touches back then. So nowadays I want, you know, it's all for registration. I want, I want to filter them down. Uh, cause I also feel that that hones our skills and the agent skills when it comes to objections. Yeah. So when you, when you guys, let's talk about the follow up then for a minute, man, um, yep. because we can generate all these leads all day long. Um, and leads is really at the end of the day, nobody's problem. Yeah. You know, right? right. You think it's a problem, but it's their inability to convert leads to appointments that, that ends up being the, the main problem for most. Right. So when, you, when, the, when these 2000 leads come in a month or, or it, it, maybe it's just an individual agent and they're getting 200. Uh, you know, uh, maybe a lot for an individual agent to take in. Like, what are you doing with the follow-up? Because we still have to go out there and service our clients. We can't be on the phone for 10 hours a day. Yep. You know, um, uh, how do you nurture those to convert them? Yep. So I changed my model um, a few years ago. I used to have it so that when a lead came in, it would ring to everybody. So it was like whoever picked it up first. It's kind of like a lottery. And then I went to a uh, um, uh, a course over in Omaha again, and I was challenged with the question, what are you doing from an accountability standpoint for your agents? And at the time, I'm like, I thought about it, and he's like, well, what if you're not here tomorrow? Can they move on? And I, my answer was no, they wouldn't have made it. So I flipped it. So then um, I brought on an ISA, and I had it so that the ISA was the one who was answering the phone. Um, that worked okay, but not really great. And so she was trying to do a lot of it. Um, you know, conversion had its drip campaigns and things like that. Um, then I'm not sure who I was watching, but I was watching another webinar and a guy said something about having it in a agents on call for 24 hours. Um, so I switched it. So they're on, they're on, they get the bulk of the leads unless it's on a specific listing. Uh, that come in over a 24 hour period from 5 p.m. to 5 p.m. go to one person. Then they have to spend the rest of that time nurturing those leads before their next lead day. On top of that, after, so they are expected to make a certain amount of text. So when the lead first comes in, I feel that text works best to, as first communication. So text, then follow up with a call, maybe an email. And they're expected to do that uh, probably half a dozen times in the first two days. At that point, the ISA will jump in and reach out and, and, and on behalf of the agent and you know, say, hey, I'm uh, uh, such and such as assistant. Uh, is there anything we can help you with? And then after that 15 touch, they get just dropped on the drip campaign. And then that goes out regularly. Again, the one that Perfect Storm sends out now. And then she has it on her schedule to just send out a mass thing about once every few months to the old leads and ask if they're still looking. Um, now with Facebook, you know, there's auto messages there that follow up. Uh, a lot of it's automated um, between the systems that we have and the ISA that are doing the follow up. Yeah, I love that, man. And, and I know most agents, that's what they want to get to, right? Because I think most of us are in the boat that we hate the phones, you know, right. And, and we want to be, you know, we want to be servicing our clients and, and selling homes and, and grow. Right. And, and I'll tell you, dude, like I, I hear now I've never been a cold caller because I, I, I hate cold calling. You know, I've always found ways to get business to come to me. Um, uh, but dude, e even when I was personally in production and, you know, having 1200 leads a month come to myself personally, and even at that volume, I've never spent more than 90 minutes on the day, on the phone a day with the phone. Right. But it's about mastering the systems. Like you said, you know, right. He right. comes into perfect storm, I respond to an email, I respond to text, goes on the thousand day long email fall and, and text right. fall trip campaign. Um, and then to get, get to the point because of, you know, the phone call answer rates being so low and text rate, text messages being so high. We just got to the point where we just do video text. Yeah. Right. right. And it personalized video text. So it's not a, it's not an automated drip, but just me right. speaking personalized video to them. Um, um, and let them respond that they want to have a conversation and, and uh, not that we still don't do phone calls, but it's, it's far less than, um, you know, most people do or think, you know, right. It doesn't take near, near, well, if you take the time to set up the systems the right way. Right. Yeah, and that takes the time. You know, when I, I can't say that I've never cold called. So, and it wasn't really cold call. Those first few months I did do expireds 
you know, there were 60 to 70 expireds a day. And I've within a six month period at that time I had, uh, you know, I got up to 20 some listings fairly quickly and everyone's like, Oh, you're so great. You're, you're, you know, you're killing it. Well, what they didn't realize is because the market was bad, those weren't selling. And what I was seeing is I was in bankruptcy and every time I got a listing, I had to go buy a lockbox and a new sign that I didn't have the money for. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, now, I mean, it's, there's, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to, to hit, cast a wider net and pull those in um, than what it was before. Because the other part of it is, you know, we talk about SOI, you know, there, there are people out there that say, you know, you got to categorize your leads in the bucket. You know, you got your A's, your B's, your C. I've never been one to do that, but I also um, am very simplistic in, in my follow-up with my SOI. It's a email. It's an occasional text saying happy birthday or, uh, and then once a month, month, uh, we do send out it's $5 gift cards to a birthday list that Facebook tells us when they are. So those are really the three things that we do as far as a follow up with them. That's awesome, man. So then 2016, you, you decided to jump into the brokerage world. Um, at that point, I mean, your team's really growing and going good, you know, and, and, um, you know, the brokerage world, man, isn't, isn't as lucrative as some may think. Right? Um, you know, wish everybody, I wish everybody knew that. You know, a, a lot of agents, you know, sit there and have this assumption that the brokers are making all this money. But when you, when right. you see the margins, man, they're thin. And until you get to a very large size, yeah. um, um, there, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a tough play, man. Um, uh, what, what led you into deciding to, to start that in addition to your team in 2016? Yeah, so it, it dates back um, to a few years prior to that, actually. Um, like I said, I used to be extremely secretive about what we, how we did things. And I got to a point to where I was like, okay, we've reached this level in real estate, but I feel that I could do more. And so I started to, and this is where, this is actually where our connection started to come into play. I started calling around um, local agents who've been in the business 20, 30 years. And asked them how they did it. How do they stay relevant? What do they, you know, and, and they wouldn't talk to me. And so then by chance, and I can't even tell you how it happened. I think it's because of the Remax connection. I started connecting with these, you know, other big producers, uh, much bigger than we are on the East Coast. And, and I reach out to them. They talk to me a little bit. And then, like I said, and I've never met him in person. It would be great to someday. But uh, I, talked to, I talked to Ryan Finch and he directed me to you. So then um, I'd opened my office uh, and I talked to you and, and um, I started following this podcast and you, I, I started, you bring on all these guests and I would start following them and I would connect with them. And then after a while, the one thing I noticed was that everybody that I talked to, a lot of them, the guests that come on your show, they're givers. They're not secretive. They like to share. They want to make people better. It was at that point I wanted, I knew I wanted to become a broker to help make people better versions of themselves, not just in business, but in, in life, if I can do that um, within my ability. So um, I started off, like I said, as a minor partner in some offices, helping to manage a couple smaller offices. And then when the opportunity presented itself, um, I thought a lot about it and, and me and my three partners decided to take the leap and move forward. Um, and, and it was at that point that, you know, I decided to, aside from helping, cause I'm like, well, if I, if I can make our agents better, why not? But then I'm like, well, why can't I just help make everybody better? And again, from being a, can be in similar circles as you and Chet Black and things like that. The, the networking of people that are brought together from all different industries and, and, and um, brokerages, but that are giving of their information is phenomenal. So I was like, there are no more secrets. I have no more secrets. There's nothing that I don't share at this point. And that is what led me into getting into the brokerage. And it was actually in Scottsdale. We got approached to, uh, to purchase the company. Um, and the, uh, just to be able to, I, I did not get into being a broker for the money. You just hit the no on the head right there a minute ago. It's not about the money. There was way more than that as a team leader. Um, it just, I just progression to help people and watching massive givers give led me to where I am right now. Yeah. Love it, dude. So, you know, so you've been at this for about three years, you know, now. Full broker. Um, yep. 
Yeah, and you guys continue to crush it on the brokerage side. I mean, last, last year, you know, 4,500 uh, uh, homes sold over a billion in volume. Mm-hmm. Now, with, with that kind of volume, because you, you talked about the size of your town, mm-hmm. um, I mean, it, there's probably not that many rooftops in your town. So I'm assuming that you guys – you well, know, or, uh, uh, I mean, how, do you have multiple offices throughout? Yeah. Where, where are you, what does that look like? Yep. So when I talk about my specific town, I'm on a, I'm in a smaller little suburb outside of the, uh, Des Moines, Iowa Metro. So the Metro itself has about 70, uh, 750,000 rooftops, but we are statewide. We have offices, um, spread out throughout the state. Uh, we have 14, right now and we just acquired one over in the quad cities area uh right on the border of illinois and iowa in davenport earlier this year so we have around 200 agents spread out throughout the state yeah well 200 agents doing 4500 transactions that's insane dude yeah we have a lot of top producers at our company you know we talked offline a little bit ahead of time that the you know the remax uh transaction count is around 17, which is a lot for, you know, higher than the industry standards. Our agents are actually in the mid twenties and have been as high as 28 per agent. Um, And uh, last year we had five or six um, agents do over in teams, teams also do over 40 million in production. Um, And so they're just, they're all top producers. Now my my you know I don't know if this is if this if there's anything to this but um this is just my theory you know of studying all these different models and and I was with Remax for nine years and loved Remax and you know Bill I mean I it wouldn't have been for Remax my mentors within the Remax organization I wouldn't be who I am today and where I am today um um but uh, as far as the the production right because you're talking the I mean if you globally the average Remax agent mm-hmm. closing seventeen deals a, a, a year annually. Mm-hmm. And that's average, right? Well, your average realtor just outside of Remax is what point point five a month. So let's just yeah, say something like that. Yeah. Six a, a year or whatever. E- even on teams, we see that pretty average on mega teams where it's like point seven. I think mine's point eight three. You know, mm-hmm. right? The closings per month on average. Um, um, in the bucket there, and um, you know, my my theory is is because there's that that the monthly fee involvement. And, and a lot of people balk at that and they want to go to these, you know, flat transaction fees of these split companies, right? But because it's an real estate, it's an industry of, we don't have any accountability. And I right. can't tell you how many people I've met over the years that were like rock star sales guys or, or gals in their previous job, but they, they had a manager, they had a quota. If they didn't meet it, there was consequences. Then they transition to real estate um, and they do, they, they just end up flopping, you know, right. Cause that lack of accountability and right. You know, look, man, that, that, you know, with that fee, you know, right. Dude, like you got, you got to make sure you're selling and producing and it creates that level of accountability. I don't know if there's something to that, but that's um, kind of the theory behind it of, cause like for me, when I was at Remax, now I, I know every model is different, but I was eight to be at the to essentially a hundred percent. I'd pay eight ninety five a month. Mm-hmm. Right. So whether I'm selling or not, I got to pay that money. So if I'm not right. closing a deal, man, that hurts. Yeah. Right. I, um, um, it may do it. Got me on fire, especially being new, you know, right. When I, when right. I started out with them. Yeah. I think there's a little something to that. I think it's changed a little bit since the industry's changed. Um, you know, the, uh, I think it's all, you know, like I said, every model is different, but it's also, I think goes to what you get for it. You know, within our model, we have a ton of support. So I know in a lot of markets, you have that fee, but then you also have a separate transaction fee that you have to pay and you got some a la carte things that you have to pay. We cover that all within our, within the fees that we charge. We have, we essentially assign full staff, three full staff people to every agent. Now, granted, they share that agent or that staff person, but that our back end support in, in my opinion is what sets us apart from everyone else in the market. People come here thinking they know what to expect. And then their production on average jumps 40% the next year, just because of our back end support. It takes, they essentially get a team by joining. It takes so much off their plate. You know, we'll do deed signings with them, with their clients. I mean, we do so much for them that, um, you know, it, it make it, it, they see value in it. Now that being said, we do have a couple other plans that they, they are good for uh, just getting started. Um, the 
uh, they, I, my suggestion is always when they ask, well, you know, when should I go up to that? We refer to it as a network fee. You know, I usually tell people you know, around 8 million in production is you got some steady business going then and that that monthly is not as scary at that point and mm-hmm. when you really break it down and you put them side by side it's actually when you pay the least amount is when you're at that level because of the you know if there's more paperwork and stuff it's just usually a little bit more that's paid in yeah and and you know the the, the other component too uh, and i didn't even think about it until we just started having this conversation it's like every and, and i know this may not be tr- 100% true, but in my experience, every franchise owner that I've met w- within Remax has, has come up from the ranks, you know, right? Mm-hmm. They, they've been come, they, they were a top producer themselves, you know, created a top team, grew to the point where it made sense to become a franchise owner. Um, um, and for a lot of the similar reasons that you did it, to, to share your knowledge out there with others and, and, and to go out there with it. So, you know, success for osmosis and having the mentor. Right. And, and when you have that mentor to follow that is a top producer yourself, it's like the reason I joined Remax uh, out of the gate was the Remax broker owner. Like he was, he was the most successful dude I'd ever met in my life at that point. I was like, I want to be him, you know, right. Um, and whatever it took to, to have proximity to him, I wanted to do. And it just seems like Remax just farms internally through the rankings. Um, just so many great franchise owners that come up organically through the system you know, and that lead that, so that leadership that you get is huge, right? When people can right. come to you and, and be like, hey, Shane, what do I do here? Mm-hmm. That is, it, it, you know, I, I'm in a lot of, uh, 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 you know, just rooms with just broker owners and, and right. let's just say broker owners themselves versus going to this room with team leaders themselves, right? And it, dude, it's two totally different rooms, right? When I'm in with so many broker owners, it, it blows my mind that deep the detachment, how detached they are, and, and this is speaking generalities, not for everyone, yeah. from uh, uh, what it takes to, to support their agents and, and create success. And when I hear their thoughts and ideas of, of how they're going to add value, bring value, I'm like, it, it gets comical. I'm like, what, that, what are you guys fucking smoking? Like you have, right. so many broker owners have no idea of what it takes to become a successful agent you know, versus like you, you know, right? Like, dude, you know, exactly, you know, right? It, it, right. The level of mentorship is, is unmatched. Right. No, I agree with that. I, I do feel that that's definitely, there's value in the fact that we've been there, done that. Yep. hundred percent, dude. So h- how do you manage all this? I know we're going a little bit long on time here, but how, oh, that's fine. how, how do you manage four, you know, 14 offices now, you mm-hmm. know, right? Plus your team, you know, mm-hmm. plus you got all this other stuff that we haven't even talked about. Like, like right. And your family and, yep. and you, you know, you made the comment about your wife earlier. Um, you know, how, how do you, how do you, what does your day look like? How do you keep all this together? Well, I'm very, very intentional and I harp over and over about time blocking. So I block out every facet of my life. Um, you know, and sometimes like I use an example, uh, I have on my calendar to go to the gym every morning at five o'clock. Well, you know, I actually overslept the other day, but it was still on my calendar. It blocked it off. So it does two things. It keeps that in, in that spot open or, you know, filled with that. But it also, when I look at it, I'm like, crap, I was, I did not, I was not my best today because I did not get up and go to the gym. So on top of that, all of my people, my, uh, my agents and our people at the company, the head staff, my partners, everybody, we all have access to each other's calendars. So they can tell me when they need me, where to be. They can see where I'm at and if I'm available. Um, my agents are the same way. I can see them. My thing is, is I don't, cause I'm a full, again, I'm fully conscious and people have to have a life. I don't care if someone's getting their nails done, they're getting a massage, whatever. I just need to know where they're at. So I know, if an issue arises, how do we address it? I do that by time blocking. So on top of that, from the calendar, so that's the first piece. I have great people around me. My personal staff is phenomenal. They've been with me for five to six years. The team agents are phenomenal. Like I said, that runs itself at this point. At the brokerage level, I have three other partners. We have different areas of the business that we, that we focus on. I do a lot of the day-to-day operations with the staff. Um, the couple of the others, uh, help, do help it with the recruiting and just, uh, agents. Another one does a lot of legality stuff. And then the staff are all specialists in their areas. And I don't know where it was the other, I, I read, I read something the other day is that becoming a, a 
man or becoming an owner or a um, someone in my position isn't about telling people what to do. It's about putting good people in place to tell you what to do. So literally I, they tell me what to do, where to, you know, what to, what they need from me on a daily basis. And that's how we, um, that's how I manage it all. And it all goes back to the calendar. Yeah. Love it, man. So then do you, do you ever find yourself, um, uh, you know, getting kind of pulled one, one way more of the other as far as, you know, the team growth versus the brokerage growth and like, like, what is your vision for that? Do you see yourself getting, growing the brokerage more and getting involved with that more than the team? That's an interesting question because, because of my position, it's, it's a little different than most team leaders. Most team leaders are all like, I want to grow them and I want to keep them forever. I am fully aware and I've always been fully aware that people aren't going to stay forever. So my hope and my intent was, I kind of refer to my team as an incubator. If they want to stay on it forever, great. But at some point, chances are they're going to want to be on their own. Now, when they do, I hope that they had such a great experience on the team that they stay as an independent agent within our brokerage. So it's, again, I've never recruited for my team. It's just happened organically. Um, if it, if it continues to grow, then that's great. Um, but right now, you know, broker just takes a good chunk of my time. Um, just because of the size and the magnitude of it. Um, but I, I wouldn't say it sways one way or the other. I've done good about, ba- I've done good balancing it, but I also, it's the staff that helps with that, that helps balance it. Yeah. And the, and the cool thing about it is that it doesn't have to be the ultimatum, you know, right. right. Um, especially when you, when you have the setup the right way, which seems like you've done a brilliant job at where, you know, they, they feed off of each other. Um, right. When you have businesses that feed off of each other, you can grow them exponentially at the same time. So I love it, dude. So they're all in a similar category, whether you correlate the brokerage to the team, to the home building, you know, our commercial development, you know, the brokerage leases from our commercial development companies, uh, they're, they're all tied together. Yeah. Love it, dude. So then, you know, recently I, I, I think I heard you say something about writing a book. <laughs> yeah. you, um, also then started a, a, a coaching program. So yeah. you can, what, like, what led to writing the book as well as the coaching program? And let's just, let's just talk about that here. Well, so yeah, the, I did the, both the coaching program and the book or the road to 20 million. Um, what led to that was um, for a few years, I would get people that would, uh, call and say, Hey, how, you know, would you, would you coach me? I'll pay you monthly. I'll do this. I'll do that. And I was always just like, no, no, no. And then after going to enough of these things and and seeing it, I realized that I do have something to offer. I do have a story. Um, and why not share it? And again, my goal is to help people avoid the mistakes that I made. Um, so the whole process and started this is, has been crazy, but the book was written because you know, why is anyone going to want to buy a course from me or contact me or um, work with me unless they know the backstory, they know that I've been there, I've done that and I have the credibility. So it was a two year process from start to finish by the time that the book was actually written. um, The idea happened and I'm like, I need, I need to, uh, I, I should write my own bio. Well, I mentioned earlier, I'm not good at writing. And so I I scratched that and then I'm like, I need to, I'll hire a freelancer. And so hire a freelancer turned out she wrote novels. So after a quick phone call with her, it comes over and it reads like a novel. My wife's like, what, what is this crap? You don't sound like this. So I scratched that. And then I hire a consultant. Turns out wasn't a good one. Scratch that. And then another consultant. And that one clicked. And then I spent a a day and a half in the room with that guy. We had all these ideas and what we were going to do. And since then, it's been consultant company after consulting company after consulting company helping me get to where I am now. Because again, I the way I wrote my book is I did what we're doing right now. They recorded me talking. Someone was hired to type it out, and it just, it, it launched probably 60 days ago. It actually uh, just got released on um, uh, Audible yesterday. Uh, that was a process in itself because they tell me that it had to be my voice. I didn't know one of my partners kind of sounds like Charlton Heston. So I didn't know if I wanted to go that route or if I wanted to do it. Um, they, I did it a sample and they said, that sounds great. We'll use it. Uh, send it over. They're like, nope, can't do it. Got to redo it all. Um, so that's been a, it's been a very, big learning curve. I'm glad I did it. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, um, you know, starting to gain more traction. 
the um, uh, now that I've done it, I think I could do uh, the the book process again a little quicker now that I have contacts that I've made. Um, but yeah, it's been fun. I share my personal story in detail. Um, I started that a few years ago during, it started as a four hour workshop basically. And I give a lot of the backstory starting from my childhood actually, because I don't want everyone, any, I don't want anyone to ever get the misconception that I came from money or anything like that. So I actually will show photos of some of the places that I lived and things like that. And it just kind of snowballed to what it is now. And it's just continually growing every, every month. And I've, I've, I've just, I've decided to be patient with it. I'm not going to force it. Um, I know what our value is worth. And if people want it, they'll pay for it. If they don't, they won't. So, and again, just watching you watching everyone else that, that, that has been on your show, it's giving back. Um, in a former fashion as far as the book and stuff goes. So it's pretty exciting um, when it first came out. It's, it's a little surreal to see yourself for sale on Amazon and in, in, in audible. Um, but it's been a cool experience and uh, yeah, we're just excited for it to keep moving forward. Well, what I love about books, dude, is, is you got, you know, somebody's devoted their whole life to you or decades of their life, um, you know, and spent millions of dollars trying to refine and figure out and, and you get all that for 20 bucks. You know, 20 right. bucks. Well, you know, yeah. So yeah, that's why um, I think it's like 1299. Yeah. Yeah. It's an hour and a half read. And if you're like me, I'm not great at actually setting down and reading cause I can't retain super well. So I like to listen and watch. So I'm always on audible going that route. Um, so yeah, I agree a hundred percent. I learned so much from, uh, watching YouTube videos and, and, and uh, podcasts and, um, just listening to audible books. Uh, one of the, my favorite one is, um, you had Ryan Blair on and was, I went immediately went and bought his book, uh, rock bottom rock star. That was one of the best books. Have you, have you read his nothing to lose everything to gain his first book? Yeah, I did. After I did, I did. Yeah. Rock star to rock yeah he's bottom. such yeah. a badass. When I, when I started the podcast, I was like, how, how do I know if this is a, like, what would be a win for me? Yeah, you know, and, and I didn't want to make it about money and plus it's impossible to know how you monetize on a right. podcast, you know, right? Because I don't have like sponsors and stuff um, um, or I don't take them on. Um, but it was, it was going to be guests. It was like, all right, my, my two favorite entrepreneurs, you know, Grant Cardone and then, then Ryan Blair. Ryan Blair is, you know, by far my favorite serial entrepreneur, but yeah. getting him on and the only reason I was able to get him on because this is a dude that, you know, makes thirty six thousand dollars an hour, twenty four seven. Right, right. He's right. the CEO and owner of of a billion dollar company at this point. And um, but I got him on because of that book launch. So oh, so really? before the book actually released, I pre ordered one hundred of them. Okay. And then I went to his PR person and I was like, look, I want to bring them on. Here's our audience size. Here's all of this. You know, right? I told a little bit about me being a big fan of his. I'm like, I'm gonna do. A, a big book giveaway on the podcast, yeah. which we did on the podcast and, yeah. and that uh, gave away all hundred books. Plus I gave so I gave a free book away of his book, plus a free GSD mode shirt. And we paid for shipping right. all of it. And you know, and so, so all of that cost me over five grand. Um, but it was well worth getting him on for, for, uh, that was, I, was, that and was, I was only supposed to get 20 minutes and he ended up giving really? me, you know, almost a full hour, which is pretty dope. Yeah. That was a great one. And so is the Cardone one. I fought, started following Car Grant after that also. And I have all his books. I just watched a couple of his videos yesterday. Um, I, I agree with all that. Those are some high, uh, big shoes to fill for people who are striving for that. So, yeah. but yeah, and I, yeah, I actually, um, you know, I, I, when you're for the giveaways, I have a handful of those to give away too. So pr discount promo codes and stuff like that, that we'll put at the bottom. Yep. Love it, dude. Love it, man. So, um, where, where do people go learn more about, uh, pick up the book? I mean, you talked about being on Amazon or audible. They just type in the name, give a website for it. Also then, um, you know, you talked about the coaching program really, yep. you know, it sounds like it's the same thing. Teaching agents had the, the, the road to a million or path to a million, yep. 20 million. Um, yep. the next book is going to be what the, the, the road to 1 billion. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I, haven't you decided, billion I, I had someone yesterday, the other day tell me they're like, well, road to 20, that's, that's basically about real estate. I'm like, well, no, you can sell 20 million in cars. You can sell 20 million in construction jobs. It's all relevant to, to business in general. Um, but yeah, of course it's, you know, a little real estate heavy at the end, but yeah, so far as the, the, the coaching program, it is a uh, road to 20 million.com. There are links on there. Um, as far as the book, the audio book and the different, um, 
different platforms that we offer as far as coaching. Um, I do have a promo code specifically for GSD um, uh, viewers um, for 50% off of my, I have a seven, what I refer to as my seven step roadmap and it is literally a play by play of what we did in those first four years to go from chapter seven to 20 million in production. Uh, I also have uh, a free copy of the audio book that just went live yesterday that your viewers can have uh, uh, access to and a 99 cent copy if they're more of an e-reader uh, all on Amazon and audible. Awesome. Awesome. So and then we'll make sure we'll get, well, I'll get Troy to make sure that we have all those, those codes. Yep. So whatever you guys are watching and listening, we'll have those uh, right below uh, with the links in the codes to, to take advantage of those promos. Yep. Um, and uh, yeah, man, you know, I know we're, we're, we've, uh, we're we went long on time, but I, That's you know, all right. this has been epic dude. And, and uh, those watching, listen, I know I end every podcast for this, but information without implementation, truly is the sort of delusion. Information is a power. It's taking that information and taking action on it that allows you to have the power to create the life you know you want and deserve. And Shane shared so many amazing pieces of advice with you guys today. Make sure to take something that you learned that Shane shared with you and go out there and immediately take action so again, you can create the life that you know you want and deserve. And again, below we're going to have links to uh, Shane's book, um, his coaching program, as well as his social media links, uh, uh, Remax website, team website, so you can connect with them, check all of that out. So make sure to check below along with those promo codes. And Shane, dude, this has been uh, this has been a great time, man. It's great catching up with you and, and truly honor having you on the show, my friend. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, 100%. All right, you guys, thank you so much for your support, and we will see you next time.